Hi AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here in our video six over the chain rule. Now moving into how to use the chain rule when you're taking the derivative of natural logarithmic functions. So I'm following along with the notes that I give to my students at Avon High School. And what we find on this particular page is we start with a trip down memory lane reminding how do we take the derivative of just simply the natural log of x? And so it's likely that this particular derivative formula has already been presented to you. And maybe you've gone through various processes by which to um, illustrate why it's true, whether it's graphically. I know I have a video that I've made previously that showed you a graphical representation. But you nonetheless need to be very confident that the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x. That's where this all begins. Now, as far as this x greater than or equal to 0, you don't have to worry so much about that. That's kind of a reminder to us that x cannot be a, a 0 or even a negative number, even in the output of this derivative, because the domain of ln of x will only allow for x to be positive anyway. So the domain of the derivative is also the domain of the original function in this case. So what is the chain rule version of this problem? Well, it's probably as you would anticipate. You would take the derivative of the natural log of something that's just a little bit more robust than you, and you would take that derivative and call your answer 1 over that expression u. The only thing is you have to remember to tack on the derivative of that u with respect to x, which we sometimes call u prime. And in that case, you could actually think of that derivative as being a little bit maybe simpler to write. And a lot of students memorize the derivative of natural log of u as u prime over u. It has a nice little rhythm to it. It's easy to remember, and it will always work for you. And again, that u value is always going to have to be positive. Now I've got some properties that you may have encountered from perhaps an Algebra 2 course that are going to play a role a little bit later on in my example 6. So I'm going to hold off on this green box of information and I'd like to dive right into these examples. Now for my first example in part A, I'm going to go ahead and do the, the more meticulous approach to this that I've always let off my examples with in my previous chain rule lesson videos. And that would be to first of all rewrite the function so that there are parentheses. Well, it looks like that's taken care of for us. We see that the 2x is the inner function, um, the bubblegum part of our charms blow pop sucker, if you remember the analogies that we've talked about before. So I could say that the u is equal to that 2x. In which case, you can immediately say that y would be the natural log of that u. And remember that our chain rule says that the derivative of y with respect to x is simply going to be the derivative of y with respect to u times the derivative of u with respect to x. We saw that in a previous uh, lesson. And I like to sometimes think of, well, why do they call this the chain rule? Is that you can think of these as being two links in a chain. And any time that you see a multiplication symbol, that's where the two separate derivatives link up or are multiplied. And of course, it goes without saying that the du's would cancel, and dy over dx is similar to bo on both sides. So how do we pull this off? Well, easy enough. When we take this derivative of y with respect to x, we start off with the derivative of y with respect to u. That's the natural log of u's derivative with respect to u. And that in and of itself is just 1 over that u. But we must multiply that by the derivative of u with respect to x. Since our u is 2 times x, we know his derivative is going to equal 2, at which point this would be 1 divided by our u if we back substitute 2x and then continue to multiply by the 2. We can see that this indeed was this u prime over u that we see up here. Now notice that we can cancel those 2s, and we would thus get 1 over x. And I'd like to ask a question here. I'm kind of wondering, what would be the situation on our hands if this 2 was any other constant? Maybe it was a 7. Maybe it was a 35. Does that change the answer? And the answer to that question is no, it would not. Because in any case, you would have that constant down here in the bottom with 
that same constant up in the numerator and they would cancel. So essentially, the natural log of a times x, where a is any positive constant, is going to be 1 over x. All right, let's go ahead and move on to part b, but I'm not going to write the extra workout. I'm not going to be so meticulous about it because I don't think that we need to do that. We have this wonderful tool u prime over u, so I certainly want to do that. I don't want to make taking these derivatives any more tedious or time consuming than they have to be. So we start off by taking the derivative of u, which is the derivative of the numerator, 2 times x, in this case, plus 0. And we write that over the denominator, x squared plus 1, and we are done. That is all that you have to do. It's that simple, u prime over u. You want to make taking the derivatives of natural log one of the easier things in your calc class. There's a lot of things in calculus that I know are difficult, but you can certainly be strong at this. OK, now just as I say that, we start to get into some problems that are a little bit trickier. Like, look at part c. y is equal to x times the natural log of the sine of x. Probably didn't even think you could take the natural log of a trig word, but you can. The thing about this problem that's really important is that we have to understand that there is an implied multiplication in this problem. Now, I'm not saying that you would have to rewrite this to see that. Maybe you don't want to rewrite that step at all, and that's perfectly fine with me if you're a student of mine. But what you do need to recognize is the fact that this is going to require a product rule because of that multiplication. So if I take this derivative, I will start off with the derivative of x, which is 1, of course. Multiply that by the natural log of sine of x. And then I would add x. And then we would be on our way to take the derivative of the natural log of sine of x, which is really this video's main topic. So that would be the natural log of u. So I would use my u prime over u. The derivative of sine is positive cosine. And we would write that all over sine of x. And for all intents and purposes, you have a correct derivative standing right in front of you. Now, if it were to appear as a multiple choice question, it's likely it could be rewritten, of course, without putting that extraneous 1 in front. And then the cosine over sine, as you can see, could be consolidated into a single trig word, and that trig word would be cotangent. I'm not saying that this is a very common practice, but it is something that you want to be in tune on uh, just in case you encounter these problems, maybe on exam prep material or what have you. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at part D. Part D is a little bit different as well. We are going to use the chain rule, uh, but we're going to use it a little bit differently here because we don't have the natural log of something very complicated. We just have the natural log of x. So to take this derivative, we're just going to use the power rule that we discussed earlier, the general power rule from a few videos ago. And that would suggest that the 3 would come out in front of this natural log of x, at which point we would raise all of that natural log of x to the second power. And then we would finish up and multiply by the derivative of the natural log of x, which of course is 1 over x. And basically, you're finished. There's really nothing to simplify. The only thing that one could do is probably write this as a single fraction with the x in the denominator if they so chose. Now, before we move on, let's just say that this x was a little bit more complicated. Let's say that it was a 2x, or maybe an x to a second power. This would be a very interesting problem in that it would require two usages of the chain rule. Very similar to my last video that I talked about using two usages of the chain rule when you were differentiating complex trig words. Let's move on to our final example, which is our doozy for this problem. y is equal to the natural log of x times x squared plus 1 squared all over the square root of 2x cubed minus 1. Well, if you think about u prime over u, well, that's something to discuss. Should we use u prime over u? After all, it's perfectly allowed. It's part of this lesson. But I don't think that we would be really eager to take the derivative of u. That would be a very challenging situation. I mean, let's think about that for just a second. If we were to take the derivative of the numerator, 
I would, uh, I'm sorry, the derivative of this entire expression u, which is the numerator of our u prime over u, we would have a complete quotient rule on our hands. So in other words, if you remember a quotient rule, if I let, if I let the top function be f, and if I let the bottom function be g, I could think of it like this, f prime g plus f times g prime all over g squared. Well, that doesn't seem so bad. Actually, it's not the right thing. I need to put a minus there. Shame on me. This is the quotient rule. But as I look at this f prime, something strikes my eye. And that is, in the process of taking the derivative of this numerator, we would either have to expand this out, which I don't know if I want to do that, or we would have to take a product rule. So we would have a separate type of embedded process, which I might call x f star, and maybe I'll call the x squared plus 1 g star, and then I would have f star prime times g plus f times g star prime, and then I'm like, oh my gosh, I have an embedded product rule within a chain, uh, quotient rule, and I didn't even mention that these two parts, whenever I start thinking about differentiating those, I have chain rules involved. Not what we want to do, you guys. So I want to abandon this idea completely and think about trying to take this derivative a bit easier. And alas, that is where this green box comes into play. These are your logarithm properties that we hope that you've learned from either an Algebra 2 course or a pre-calculus course. It's very likely that you may have been exposed to them twice if your school has a curriculum set in place where logarithms are a part of both of those subjects, which can be very helpful to see it twice before you get to calculus. Now, if you're sitting right now in calculus and you're thinking, I don't remember these, or you think that they were never taught, all is not lost. I would strongly suggest that you spend some time scouring YouTube or other places on the internet and find some good videos. Use key search words like logarithm properties and you would be able to come across some really well uh, produced videos that will give you a little bit more insight into why these relationships are the way that they are. Because I don't want to get into the details of the algebra and why these work, because the purpose of this video is to work with the chain rule only and teach you the calculus. But nonetheless, we have these four very popular properties. The natural log of 1 is 0. In fact, the logarithm of any base of 1 is going to be 0. But it's properties 2, 3, and 4 that are going to get a workout here for example 6 part e. Whenever we take the natural log of a product of two expressions or two numbers a times b, we are allowed to separate this into two separate logarithms with a plus sign. The only thing I'm going to talk about in terms of how this connects to algebra is that I always tell my students that logarithms are just exponents. That's why we study them. And we have a rule in algebra that says whenever you multiply two like bases together, their exponents get added together. And this is kind of the same idea in a slightly different uh, uh, environment. The natural log of a product is the sum of the natural logs. I'm going to jump to 4 instead of going to 3 because I think 2 and 4 kind of tie together a little bit nicely. And you can probably imagine that if we have a quotient, the natural log of a quotient, we're going to subtract the natural log, top minus bottom. The same idea, whenever you're dividing like bases, you would subtract the exponents. And then finally, if we have a natural log of a value that's raised to a power, not outside of the entire function, so not like the entire natural log is raised to the power, like in part d, but only the value within the logarithm is raised to a power. We can bring that power out to the front, as you can see we did here, and multiply it by that natural log. This replicates the idea of whenever you have a base raised to a power and you raise it yet to another power, you would multiply those two exponents together. So how do these work for problems like 
6e. Well, you are first going to spend a moment rewriting this thing using logarithm properties. This is not calculus. This is an algebra step. So I'm going to start off with the natural log of the very first expression I see, which is x. And that's really all I need because I don't see anything else attached to this x. The next thing I notice is that I have a multiplication relationship here by our properties above that says that we are going to add and we have another natural log coming up. But before you write that natural log, notice that there is an exponent attached to x squared plus 1. That exponent 2 can come out in front and then we can multiply it by the natural log of our x squared plus 1. And that would take care of the enumerator. Now that we move to the denominator, that in and of itself is going to invoke the subtraction because we are looking at a quotient here. We look at the 2x cubed minus 1 and ask ourselves, is there an exponent attached? And the exponent is a 1 half. A lot of students want to think, isn't that a negative 1 half exponent because this is in the denominator? Well, remember, we've already taken care of the fact that this is in the denominator by placing the minus. So we essentially have that negative one-half exponent. And then we have the natural log of the expression 2x cubed minus 1. Now if you step back and look at this, we just see three separate natural logarithm expressions that we can take the derivative of each separately fairly easily. Two of them, however, will require the chain rule. So let's see what we have. The derivative of the natural log of x, of course, is 1 over x. No chain rule required there. And then if we move to our next term, we know that we're going to have a fraction, u prime over u, namely. The 2 in the numerator out in front will stay. The derivative of x squared plus 1 is 2x. And then the denominator, of course, is x squared plus 1. It would have been the u in the original problem. We move on to our third term. We draw our fraction. I notice this 1 over 2 is going to bring about a 2 in the denominator now. And if we take this derivative of natural log of 2x cubed minus 1 using u prime over u, the derivative of the u is going to be 6x squared now. And the denominator is 2x cubed minus 1, of course. And we have a correct derivative. Now, maybe it can be simplified a little bit. There's not a lot that I'm going to do with this, you guys. I might just multiply the twos together in the second fraction. And as far as the third fraction is concerned, we probably could do a little reducing with our 6 and our 2. Not much more than that. And I would be very happy with this particular result. I know we could get a common denominator, but I just I don't want to go there. It's very unlikely. It's, it, it's something that you're not going to see on the advanced placement exam. It's not a test about algebra. It's a test about your knowledge of calculus. And we've demonstrated that we definitely know calculus if we can get to this point. So you always want to make sure that on your super complicated natural log expressions, that if you don't want to take that u prime, break it apart using any of these logarithm properties that will assist you to make that derivative just a bit easier. Anyhow, I hope this helps and we look forward to seeing you at our next couple of videos that will complete the lesson topic 3.1 over the chain rule. Thanks for joining us.